All right, let's play some old mech games. So, uh, I thought I'd start with Mac Paint, which, of course, is not a game; it's a paint program. But if you if you look at Mac gaming history, uh, there's a pretty decent argument you can make that everything starts at Mac Paint. Uh, it it kind of defined a lot about what Mac gaming would be, uh, and it, it it created the aesthetic. It uh, defined how user interfaces would work. Uh, and if you talk to people who were making games on the Mac right at the beginning, it's the thing that they that they all describe as critical. Um, so if you've read if you've read the uh, second chapter of my book, uh, 1984 chapter, uh, you, you, you'll get some of the quotes from, from a few of the people who talked about that stuff. Uh, and I'm going to look at their games very soon. But first, I just wanted to take a moment to to look at the original Mac Paint, to show off how its interface looks. And if you if you think about uh, games now, even y I think there's an element here that you can see. Uh, the most obvious one being SimCity. Now, Will Wright originally was creating SimCity on the on the Commodore sixty four, but he he took his whole interface from the the way Mac Paint worked. If you if you well I'll pull up SimCity shortly. But when you look at the game, it's basically Mac Paint for city building. <laughs> I am not going to beat that Kairos shootout high score of 257,602 points. But I will be playing the game. Uh, so yeah, Mac Paint was, was a huge deal. And, uh, it inspired SimCity, which I'll look at in just a moment. First, I want to show you something. I drew in a different version of Mac Paint. Some of you might recognize this as being an awful lot like a certain planet in the game Cosmic Osmo. Uh, it's my it's my own version of it. I, I made this to be my business card. <laughs> and so um, I basically cut it off about here I think on my business card and I put it through some some shading and things and I specifically wanted to draw something in Mac Paint because it's it's a huge part of what I'm doing uh, with my with my career trying to document these fantastic old Mac games and uh, at some point maybe we'll get to Cosmic Osmo and, and you'll be able to see uh, the difference but this took <laughs> this took ages to draw. Uh, I drew this about five years ago, I think, and uh, I had the other image as a reference point. But I I went off on my own in places. Like the original didn't have a door here. Uh, I tried to capture the the same whimsy that I found in the game. And so, yeah, we'll we'll play some manhole in a minute. But since I mentioned it, let's go to SimCity for a moment. All right, version one point four. Okay. Yep. 
So uh, the the final name on that list there, Mike Foley, he was a teenager at the time. And he was actually Will Wright's neighbor. Okay, let's, uh, let's go with that. And so if you look here, you, you have basically Mac Paint, except the tool palette builds you a city. So we've got some power lines, park, should probably start with a power plant. And I'm going to build a very bad city. Dump some stuff down here and there. Lay down some roads. And so, uh, that's water. That dark shady bit, that's water. This is like just regular terrain. And then you got trees here. And I, I find this game, this version of the game really fascinating for the way it, uh, it manages to capture uh, all the, the same information that you have in the other versions of SimCity, but it only has black and white pixels, which is ridiculously hard to work with if you're trying to make a city. And yeah, I'd agree with the comment from the chat that SimCity 2000 <laughs> handles zoning a lot better. The neat thing that you can do with the tiles is you can delete individual blocks of it. So you don't have to destroy the entire thing. You can actually delete specific corners and make them rebuild it. And if you're quick, you can pop down another thing right there that overlaps that corner. Uh, th there's a fan there's a fantastic book that I read a couple of years ago. Um, I think it's called the Sim City Planning Commission Handbook or something like that. It's a it's a book from around the time Sim City came out, uh, written by I think Johnny Wilson. Uh, I can't quite make out the the name on my bookshelf uh, behind me, but I, I think it was him um, from Computer Gaming World, and it it goes into the the urban planning theory that underlies the game and uh looks at different ideas and and how uh, they how they can be executed so you have things like if you look at radial city design uh, which is very big in Europe uh it gives you tips on how you might want to build your own version of it and see how it, it works in, in the game simulation, which is not very well. Uh, the game is modeling a very specific kind of simulation uh, of you know, cities that are built in grids. And uh, on that note, there's actually some really funny um, shortcomings in the simulation. Because he had so, Will Wright had so little memory to work with that he uh, he had to come up with various tricks to make the game work. And so it's not actually running uh, the simulation like in real time continuously. It's it's running it in sort of ticks, um, and that there are some funny um, glitches or exploits you can use rather. Uh, you only need to have one power point power plant that is connected to the grid. Um, I learned this from Kaim Gingold, who's uh, studied 
the game's source code for a PhD. He, I think, has a, a book eventually coming out about it. So we've got one power plant here. If I then go and build another power plant somewhere else, say, all the way down here, I'm benefiting from that extra power in my main grid up here, even though that's not connected to anything. And you've got the same kind of, of weird things going on with the, the roads and the rail. And it's really fascinating um, hearing about all the, the ways that he, he had to, to deal with this. Uh, so anyway, let's uh, just bring the monster in. I don't remember much about my early experiences with SimCity because I was I was a very young child at the time, but I do know this was one of my earlier games. Uh, my family had this on our... we played a little bit. I put a lot more time into SimCity 2000 than this one. But I still find it really interesting to go back and play every now and then. I, I honestly don't know uh, what language the Mac version was written in. Okay, now, um, while we're on the Mac Paint theme, I have one other thing to show. This I had never heard of until I was researching my book. This is called Letter Forms and Illusion. And it's the brainchild of a guy called Scott Kim, who is a now a world-renowned puzzle designer. Uh, back then, he had um, he'd first uh, he'd, he'd had his first big success. He had a book uh, called Inversions, I think. And when he saw Mac Paint, he had this idea to try and make a, a puzzle a puzzle game that is actually using Mac Paint files. And so it's quite hard to, uh, to play this while I'm talking about it. But you can see here that uh, it steps you through things, it tells you what to do. Um, I don't have a... Obviously I haven't set this up correctly, I don't see a flips menu. Um, but there was a there's an add-on that the the game comes with that allows you to to add this extra menu, and then you can go through. Um, so I'll just jump. So it teaches you how to play. Each, I suppose, a level in the game is a different Mac Paint file. I didn't have much room in my book to tell the full story behind this, but I talked to Scott uh, in quite a bit of detail. Uh, what am I typing here? My first and last initials. Okay. So I'll just put on the shift key, type them again. Okay. I was supposed to do that in blend, wasn't I? And <laughs> uh, now what do I do? So let us pile up in the same place as if printed on ov overlapping sheets of clear plastic. It only has capital letters, spacebar advances the cursor, shift key reverses and white and delete key erases the last character. Yeah, thought that might happen. So blend positive. Now we see some cool stuff here. <laughs> yeah, I also found it kind of mind-blowing when I first saw it. Um, and 
uh, as I said, it's it's really hard to demo it right now while I'm talking about it. It's hard to to concentrate on what I'm doing. Um, but I'm gonna <laughs> do my best to show a show a bit of it. Okay, so I'm gonna blame the font. Type two edits. So the first one. I'm um, not getting anything here. Okay. Two. So that's what happened when I had an F and then I typed a V I. And that was an S and F. So we'll see how it combines the letters in all these really cool ways. Uh, let's look at a different one. How about flips? on a moment I'm uh, turning up my voice gain how's that okay following screen contains puzzles that challenge you to flip shapes in your imagination Select the entire page, okay. Uh, <laughs> don't think that quite worked the way it was supposed to. So I obviously I had not uh, set this up correctly in advance, uh, but you can see it's a really cool game uh, that does incredibly imaginative things with Mac Paint. And I think uh, Scott Kim and uh, the, what was the name of the other guy? Robin Fay Samuelson, they worked on this for about three years or so before they they finally got it released i have no idea how well it's sold but i think it's one of the the most interesting early mac games uh, and i love that you could make a game out of another program Uh, so now let's see, what shall we do next? Um, how about we look at Amazing? This is the game that is on the cover of my book. Uh, when I... Uh, when I was talking to Unbound about the book, uh, they did ask me if I had any thoughts on what I wanted the cover to be. And I my brief was basically that I wanted it to uh, have a feeling of the old Mac days, but I had no idea beyond that, uh, really. I didn't want it to just be a screenshot of something, and I, I just kind of hoped that they could come up with something interesting. And then <laughs> they came back to me 
with the cover that had this on it, and I, th I was just blown away. Amazing is one of the earliest Mac games. It was made by a guy called Steve Caps, who created the Finder. And it, he originally made it on the Xerox Alto. There we go. I guess this version, the music doesn't work. I'll show you the really hard version. Uh, this will be a hard one to do while talking about it, so I think I might uh, <laughs> go down a couple of levels. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, the, the Xerox Alto was a, a, a personal computer, basically, uh, made in Xerox Park Research, Research Labs. And uh, Steve Capps worked at Xerox Park for a while. And so he made a, a bunch of games in assembly language, uh, I think, assembly language or machine code. Uh, and one of them was a, a maze game where the mazes were, were generated as they are here. Another one uh, was. A, a clock with um, Salvador Dali style digits uh, that melted into each other and he had an idea to make a, a chess-like game uh, inspired by Alice in Wonderland but he didn't have the programming ability to put that together uh, on the on the Xerox Alto uh, it, was, it was just beyond his coding ability so then when he joined Apple and got onto the Lisa team, he decided to to pull it out and try again. And he was able to remake all the games that he'd he'd done on the Alto, on the Lisa, and then uh, Steve Jobs heard about what he'd done and decided that he had to have Caps on the Mac team. And the full story of, of that is, is really fun. Uh, I won't tell it here because I can't remember it well enough um, to, to give you the fantastic Steve Jobs quotes, but it's, it's in the book, uh, first chapter. And I, my personal relationship with this game uh, is that I, I played it when I was a very young kid, uh, could have even been the first game I played, I, I don't know, uh, and I adored it. I could just play these these mazes over and over for, for hours, uh, one day after another. This is very hard to play while talking. I think we've we've been you've got the point here. We've been looking at this for a while, so that's how to get there. Okay, let's move on to something else. <laughs> so uh, I'm not going to boot up that Alice game because it runs really badly in emulators uh, but you can look it up on YouTube it's really interesting um, uh, while we're on the subject of really old games I'll just quickly show you uh, a couple of other games that were built inside Apple this is Bust Out uh, based on Maze Wars which was originally um, a a mini computer game in the 1970s and uh, it was made by a, a few high school students uh, who then one of them took it with him to uh, MIT I think it was and um, got it remade on the machines they had there and he 
um, joined forces with a man who you you may know if you're you're into your games, uh, Dave Lebling. So the one of the creators of Zork was also co-creator of this game that was basically the first first-person shooter. Um, so if you're playing this with other people, there'll be uh, these. Uh, th- they'll be moving around this maze just like you, and you got to try and shoot them. And, um, so that's firing. You've got a shield. In this one, you you can do scans. And you've got a map of your maze here. So that was one version of of bust of maze wars. Uh, I tried to find Gene Tayak. I couldn't, unfortunately. But I did talk to the guy who made the other version of Maze Wars that was made inside of Apple. Uh, is it this one? There we go. So there's a spelling error there, but this eye graphic was drawn by Susan Kerr. Kerr? How, how do you say your name? Um, the person who made the Macintosh uh, icons and just the whole look of the Mac. She she was in charge of the graphic design. And she contributed the eyeballs for this. Okay, I'm, <laughs> I'm seeing care in the thing. So you can see he took a, a different approach. He was inspired directly by the, the version that was released on the... Um, Xerox computers in the 1980s, and uh, I don't know if I can remember how to play. Um, I'm tapping keys. Okay, that one does something. Probably should have looked. Okay, so we've got kind of random key selection here. Uh, I'm using the R key to go forward. That's G that I press to turn then. And so if you're playing multiplayer as you're moving around, um, you will come across some eyeballs. Some very, very cool looking eyeballs. And you can shoot them. And right here is some kind of teleporter. Yeah. Now if I can... Okay. <laughs> I thought that might happen. That's okay. I will have to... And we're back. <laughs> There you go, there's the eyeball graphic. Including a nice little tail for when you're coming up behind them. So the guy who made this was in uh, in the Mac team in the in the mid eighties. Um and he he did that kind of in his downtime. While Steve Jobs was overseas at a sales conference. And there's a fun story involving those two versions of Maze Wars uh, that, that I was also able to get into the book where. Um, when uh, the Apple Talk protocol was was first announced, uh, the there were some people who who kind of knew in advance, um, shortly beforehand, and they they decided that they would build their own version. So they they pulled together uh, a box of of various components that they just kind of made themselves, and they. They tested it and it worked, so they made a whole bunch of them. 
and they got some some friends to go to this like pizza parlor somewhere in San Francisco during Macworld and they they took over the back half of of this pizza parlor and they connected a bunch of a bunch of Macintoshes together and they played these two games over a network so it's possibly the first uh, LAN party uh, they called it a net party back then and I think the pizza parlor didn't mind because they're buying lots of pizza and drinks and things now uh, any requests for what I open up next Okay, a bashy strike. Bill Appleton game. Love the music. That MSP 87 you see down here, that's Mark Stephen Pierce, the artist from Dark Castle. I should say artist and designer from Dark Castle. He drew this graphic and uh, I think the helicopter in the in the game. And so Bill Appleton is the guy who made can barely hear the music because I'll turn the volume up. Is that a bit better? Okay, yeah. now can you hear the music better? Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. That was my bad. down a bit further. How's that? Is that a good balance? Or turn it down a bit more? Okay, great. Let's roll with that. Now this is a very hard game to play. Go a little bit less. Alright, oh, turn it down a bit more. <laughs> and I just crashed again. So you control this with the mouse. All systems. Uh, and am I running fast? Yeah. All systems. It's really difficult. All systems go. Ah. <laughs> all systems go. Well, I'm not doing well here at all. All systems. Why am I going off to the right constantly? Uh, this is real time. It's not exactly 3D though. Uh, he had he used a whole bunch of tricks to to make it work. And yeah, I think it does have issues with the emulator, but I have yeah. Here we go. I have had it work before. All systems. Okay, hand off the mouse. <laughs> okay. So you see here, the city is kind of generated thing. All right. I'm doing a bit better. Yeah, to make this work, Bill had to really push the Mac to its limits. He's um he's using a custom graphics driver, and he's using also using Silicon Beach Software's custom. Uh, audio driver and so I'll show you uh, 
couple of the earlier games shortly. Um, but they created their own. They created their own sound driver back in 1985. I figure if I just keep flying straight, I'm not going to crash. And um, there's there's a wonderful story of how they how they put that together, uh, where they uh, Charlie Jackson, the company founder, just wanted to have a a voice, a digitized voice, saying "Airborne, sir," in the the game Airborne, and he'd he'd seen in some Apple II games that Enemy behind. No, no good at turning Our around. He'd seen Apple II games do do stuff like that, um, and so he asked Eric Sokka, his programmer, to to see what he could do. Ooh, that was a close call. I think I'm gonna stop there. I keep dying constantly. Let's go to Airborne. So Pashi Strikes, a great game. I highly recommend that you check it out, but maybe don't play it in the standard version of Mini VMAC. Play it on a real Mac, real very early Mac, if you can. So this is how Airborne starts. That's Flight of the Valkyries. And they made it. They made the game right at the end of 1984. Um, debuted it at MacWorld in January 1985. And so, just imagine going to a computer convention in in January 1985, and you walk down down the ramp to to enter the place, and you hear that on the on the pe a set of speakers. And you go looking for, for where the sound where the sound's coming from and you see it's coming from an actual Macintosh. <laughs> this is a time when computers the sound effects were just beeps and bloops and things like that. Th these guys, rather than playing sine waves and square waves, they had actual digitized sound samples, which was incredible technology. And I had to go through a whole lot of ordeal to, to get that thing. Let's uh, pop the demo on while I talk. And they... This demo guy is not very good. So Eric Zocco very soon uh, figured out that the Mac could play digitized sounds, but but he had no idea how to do it because no one had really tried and it wasn't documented, it was it was hidden. Oh uh, yeah, you, you've got a certain type of bullet that you can curve with the mouse, which makes things very difficult. <laughs> and a jet fighter kills him. Uh, and so he, he just decided, let's, let's record some audio uh, and and try experimenting, trying to figure something out. And so he got out, he got out his portable, uh, like handheld recorder, and he he recorded some stuff he had on on his record collection. He really loves music, so he had a big record collection. And then they took it to uh, to a, a lab. Uh, Charlie Jackson was doing some linguistics study at nearby university and so they took it to the the lab there and they and then Eric Zocker wrote a wrote a program to uh, transfer that that audio from a, a mini computer at at that at that lab over to a Macintosh uh, they're using like a an acoustic coupler and uh, they had to downsample the audio uh, because it was too high quality for the Mac. And he wrote his own custom sound driver. 
kind of part, partly through trial and error, partly through just looking at what little documentation there was. And then they, they were able to, to get the Mac playing some sounds, which was incredible. But they still had a problem, which was that every so often there'd be this horrible sound. Uh, these helicopters going whop, 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 whop would be interrupted for just a moment every so often by a loud pop. And they couldn't figure out why it was doing it. And so Charlie Jackson remembers the story of this really well. And he he then decided to... Uh, sorry, Eric Zocker asked him to to start going um, one sample of audio at a time, like one, one byte of audio at a time in this uh, audio program that Eric had written. And so he's tapping the space bar to add one more byte, one more byte, one more byte. And then suddenly Eric just exclaims, I got it! And he tapped away on his calculator and he figured out that the sound buffer had to be exactly full to the very last byte. And so they then had to make the sound driver work in such a way that between screen refreshes, so as the as the um, the, the the cathode ray tube is 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 drawing the image, uh, the um, what do you call it? On top of my head, I'm forgetting the name. The I can't think of the name of it. Anyway, the, the thing that, that that goes across the screen and down the screen, it has to get from the bottom right corner back up to the bottom left. That's an in during that interrupt, yes, the retrace beam. During the during that period where the the, uh, the beam is moving from the bottom right back up to the bottom left to draw the screen all over again, they had to fill the sound buffer. And they had an extra trick, which was that they were able to mix two sounds. So, what you're hearing here is, is uh, often multiple sounds that, that have been mixed together. Um, that, and he'd just do that programmatically. He would look at what's the, the highest priority sound and what's the second highest priority sound, and he'd play, he'd mix those two together uh, in the program, send those to the sound buffer. And voila, you have this fantastic digitized sound. That's Eric. Jonathan Gay, the guy who created Flash. Charlie Jackson did the, the design work himself. Stay alive and get the highest score. So he goes steering. Move the mouse left and right or in an arc to steer the shells. And you can switch between steerable or non-steerable shells. You could even control the volume. and instructions on how to get a brand new list of top 10 scores. <laughs> Alright, let's play a quick round here. Uh, I haven't played this in a while. You see, I, I got reasonably good at one point, but that was a while ago. So 
So as I move the mouse, I'm adjusting the, the angles of the guns. Yes, Banzai was a, a demo game, and Banzai is the only one that I played as a kid. So I never, I never really knew that Airborne was a thing until many years later. And I'm about to die. There we go. I did okay, 129. This is my high score where I got about half of that. <laughs> so for comparison, let's pop into Banzai. And I don't I don't know if you guys uh had this experience as well, but when I was a, a kid games just kind of appeared. I, I didn't know where they came from most of the time. They, they would just suddenly be there. Uh, we'd have them and that would be great because I'd have a new thing that I could play and I loved it. So there you got an ad for Airborne. And they were in the very beginning shipping copies directly out of Charlie Jackson's house. You have instructions, much shorter instruction thing. Silicon beach bums. <laughs> and so you see it's basically the same game, but uh, simpler. And well, I died really fast. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's running too fast, maybe. Um, And these guys had a, a whole thing that they developed pretty early on uh, where they would wear Hawaiian shirts to everything. Uh, so the very first Macworld that they went to, they were just dressed as normal people. But then from, from then on, everything that they went to, their public appearances, they were all wearing Hawaiian shirts. And of course, the, the sound driver that they wrote for Airborne and that they used in Apache Strike, I'm not going to play it because I'm terrible at it, but they then used it in Dark Castle with some improvements. By this point, they were able to compress the sound, so they were able to fit a lot more sounds onto the disc. I love the, the animation and graphics on this. Let's go and do a quick demo. Now, Mark Stephen Pierce, when I talked to him, uh, was very down on the idea of this guy being called Prince Duncan. Uh, he he never. He never had anything to do with that name. Uh, he he wasn't consulted on it. Yeah. He he quite hates it. Yeah. Uh, but it's the name that has stuck, and it was, I believe, created by the the person who did the box. Now this this has a reputation of being incredibly difficult, which it is. Uh, and also uh, of being terrible among some people. Uh, but really, it just depends on 
when you first saw the game, if you saw the the terrible console version on the, the Genesis or the CDI, or, uh, was it on any other consoles? That's, those are the two I can remember. Uh, they were really bad because the game has idiosyncratic mouse controls and yeah. they do not transfer well at all yeah. to uh, using a directional pad. But then also, by the time it got onto those platforms, it was a few years old, and this is like kind of the Dark Souls of its day. It's an incredibly difficult game that uh, does not... Ooh. This demo guy is better than me. Does does not um do much to to help you. Uh, it, it does not allow you to to make mistakes really. Ooh. So some of these sound effects were, were done in very creative ways. Uh, you had like a, um, a fold-up table. You get the, the little metal ring that locks it in place, and that's one of the sounds. Uh, the guy's getting hit with the whip. That's Charlie Jackson doing that sound. All the voice characterizations were done by this guy called Dick Noel, who was... Uh, a professional uh, voice actor guy he, he was involved in a lot of ads um, and he did the the voice of Fred Flintstone in the pilot episode uh, they, they got someone else to do it from, from then on but he did it in the very first one and so he's the guy who came up with, with that, that squeaky sound the mouse is making. <laughs> no, he's not going to rescue the prisoners, and, and I don't believe you can. <laughs> and to my knowledge, this was the, the first instance of there being a professional voice actor doing a, a game. This demo is showing you a lot more of of the game than, than I would be able to uh, with my terrible Dark Castle ability. If you don't jump on that st above that step that he just passed, then you will die. And yeah, you notice the the MSP down in the bottom right corner. Mark Stephen Pierce at this point in time was signing all of his artwork. So there you go, voice characterizations by Dick Noel. Jonathan and Mark were living on opposite sides of. America at the time. Uh, Mark was in Chicago, Jonathan in San Diego, and so they would send floppy disks via mail to each other. And Mark remembers it as being a uh, very slow process at the beginning, but then they were able to, to start doing uh, express post during development. And so you note here in this about text, it never once, it never names him as Duncan. Instead, he is you. And yes, as as noted in the the chat, Mark Stephen Pierce did the animation demos for Macromind's video works, and that is actually what he was doing um, right before he joined Silicon Beach to to work on Dark Castle. They they had a bit of a rivalry with Macromind. And so there was maybe a bit of controversy them them hiring him. 
that he had quit Macromind in a in a huff because they uh, they needed some some more funding, and uh, so they got some investment from I think one of the parents of one of these guys, and Mark thought that it was uh, unfair that his share in the company should be diluted by that, and so he he left in a big huff and years later he learned that that was just standard business practice and i don't know if this was the first instance of the the was the uh, keyboard controls but it's one of the earliest and certainly given dark castle's influence uh, because there were lots of people who were making making games in the 1980s who who would have played it on the Mac or uh, on Amiga. Uh, g given its influence, it possibly would have uh, been the game that made that uh, go on the road to becoming standard. So whoever that Robert guy is, he's pretty good. All right, now, any requests for what's next? What is deep angst? Okay, I'll show you that first. Uh, deep angst is a world builder game. <laughs> it's a very odd game. So graphics involve some graphic diddling by the, the guy who made this, but most of it is from Silicon Beach because Silicon Beach released world builder. Novice to intermediate <laughs> graphics with sound adventure. Created as part of a, a review of the program. Uh, I wish that more reviews of uh, game making software would involve the creation of very odd games like this. So, uh, the way to adventure is south. And so I can navigate via different methods. I can go up to the menu here and choose something. I can use the shortcut that you see next to it, or I can type it out. So it must have been the anchovies. That vaguely familiar sound, I believe you could probably guess what it's meant to be. So let's see if we can go west. Nope. So now I can head to the east. All around me is a void. Could I have forgotten something? Let's head back west. Maybe I want to get that manga shout. Uh, yeah, I, I, d I don't know about playing Psychotic um, <laughs> live on the air. That's a, it's a pretty dark game. Um, I don't know what what age groups are, are watching this thing. No, I haven't played Pararena yet. The maniacal cackle of an incredibly bald Indian. 
Do I want to see the scepter wizard? So our uh, world builder was released in 1986, I think, uh, but it was actually made in 1984. Uh, and it, obviously, if it had been released at that time, it would have been a bit more revolutionary than it was. Uh, it, it was very significant anyway. Um, but if it had been released back when when he he. Uh, Uh, what's that? The sword? Yeah. If he'd released it in 1984 when he originally made it, uh, it would have predated a lot of the games. Can't go north, can't go south, can't go east. Now another thing that um you could do in world builder was you could um uh map things to the mouse so it's not done here but in some games if you click you might open a door or something like that Yes no maybe Search nothing unusual can't go north. And you can click to pick up objects. Yes, no, maybe. Yes, no, maybe. And so this has a very silly sense of humor. Uh, oh, I think it's frozen on me. Well, I think our, our adventure in deep angst is over. I'm going to have to reboot. Mouse is still not responding. Might need to close the program and start again. Let's just try this one more time. What's the okay, just click. Now let's hope for the best. Okay, great. Mouse is working again. Yeah, it's a really cool story about about Ray Dunican being being awesome in the comments there. And Ray's also the the reason that World Builder was able to to work really well on Power Power PC Max. He he put out a, a Power PC build. And uh Bill Appleton, by the way, is kind of amazed that this code that he wrote mostly in 1984 continued to work all the way through the classic era. Uh, 
let's see. Um, I already played the Pashi Strike. Some word runner, right? So this was one of the first, one of the very earliest uh, Mac ports. Um, and a pretty good one at that. Uh, can I remember the controls? Maybe I play with a mouse. So I'm using a, a pirated edition here, uh, which you can tell by that. Use the keyboard. I J K L A S. Okay, we'll see how I go. I have not played this version of Load Runner in a very long time. But it is another game that I had on, on my Mac Plus as a kid. And yeah, as, as noted there in the comments, uh, this is what games sounded like on the Mac before you had digitized sound. Uh, just basically just like they, they sounded on everything else. So yeah, that's a load runner. Uh, you can get extra men, you can start from different levels. Uh, I don't remember how many levels there are. I thought level 20 might be harder than that. And you got a built-in editor, so you can make your own. 150 levels, okay. Uh, this actually, I can't remember was this made <laughs> in the 1980s, but this is officially Bungie's first game. This is Alex Seropian, 1990. free but you can pay 15 bucks for source code <laughs> so basically it's pong spelled backwards
with some sound that he ripped from a different game. Amazing to think that we went from this to to games like Marathon and Halo. Of course, uh, Alex wasn't really the the designer or or programmer genius. Uh, he was he was the business guy most of uh, his time at Bungie. Um, but he he did also do uh, what I think is fantastic sound design on the original marathon. Match point. Okay, I'm about to lose. Nice use of Mac Paint. <laughs> Let's pop into At the Carnival. So Cliff Johnson uh, gets a whole chapter in my book, and he made he made a few Mac games, uh, starting with The Fool's Errand. Uh, but this is the only one that I played when I was a kid. Uh, 180 puzzles. Uh, his other game, his other two Mac games, uh, kind of, they're puzzles within puzzles. They're they're meta puzzle games. This one is just a, a collection of puzzles, uh, based around the theme of the carnival. And he worked at a carnival when he was, uh, when he was a, a young man uh, in high school. Uh, he he did some stuff at the carnival to to get money for for making a movie. He wanted to to make films. Uh, this collection, and so some of some of the puzzles are, are jumbles like this. In my late teens. Five different parks. There's also a uh, color version of this. Not doing very well here. Um, that should go up here. I was right before.
goes up here. Okay, almost there. What am I missing? Does this go down the bottom? Hurry, hurry, step right up. So then you've got all kinds of different puzzles. We have a word jumble. Another one of these. Laugh in the dark. He was used this puzzle type a lot. Uh. And each puzzle, he would give you a description of, of what you got to do, how it works. So we've got to create three words that read horizontally and three that read vertically. The first letter in the first row is already correct. <laughs> anyway, you get the idea. This is the one that made the, the greatest impact on me. Uh, that sound uh, is your piercing. So you see, you gotta just click your way through this maze, and every group of people will push you in a different direction. Uh, it's been a while since I played it. Anyway, when you get to the end of this, it, it says something like, uh, sometimes the crowds are scarier than the riots. The art style that you see here um, was inspired by uh, some really old movies. So Cliff Johnson was a, a big film geek. Uh, and he, when he when he was in high school, he wanted to make horror movies, but then when he actually went to film school, he fell in love with uh, more art, art house type things. And then he finished university and discovered that the, the kinds of movies he wanted to make, they were basically only made in Europe. And so he, he, he had to take on contract work doing things like, um, movies for uh, selling an air conditioner or something like that. And then he started putting on these uh, 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 
these puzzle hunt type parties and and from there he he made uh, a paper and pencil game mystery game um with a, a handmade book called the the fool's errand and that years later he turned into a, a, a computer game uh, she developed in in basic he, he was not a computer guy but he had bought a macintosh one day he just kind of randomly walked into a computer store and was fascinated by the Mac. And uh, the reason that the the Fool's Errand book thing that he made never went anywhere was that he'd given it to some friends as a, a Christmas present and at the end the, the big puzzle would uh, just be a coded message that when you decode says Merry Christmas. But only one friend was able to actually solve the thing and everyone uh, was incredibly frustrated. And so it wasn't until uh, he got the, the Macintosh that he he learned that uh, maybe he could do it interactively and and maybe he could find people who thought like him, and he did. Uh, he would have people going up to him at, at conventions uh, saying, I hate you, uh, in a, a loving, joking way because they just were so hooked on his games that they couldn't stop playing and they and they missed an exam or, or they lost a whole lot of sleep or something like that. Uh, let's pop into Continuum for a minute. Uh, so this was a, a shareware game, uh, except it was... It was not... Um, distributed as shareware is distributed as beerware because the guys who made it they thought shareware was a joke they had uh, they had signed a deal to get it published commercially but that that fell through and then they thought well let's release it anyway we've put so much effort into this thing but we don't think we're going to make any money, so let's ask people, if you like it, send us some beer. And uh, it, it turned out that a whole lot of people did actually send them beer, and most of it either got confiscated by the postal department because you're not allowed to send alcohol through the mail, apparently, uh, or it was destroyed in the process of shipping it because it wasn't packed correctly and so the poor guys would open the box and there would just be a spilled beer everywhere but they in the end they got about five thousand dollars worth of beer so <laughs> maybe shareware d does work after all or maybe just a whole lot of people thought it was funny that they asked for beer So Randy Wilson, uh, as you see, Stanford email address, he just just started uh, doing a, a degree at Stanford, I think, in uh, computer science. He was amazed at how popular the game turned out to be. Uh, it got talked about a lot on um, message boards online. Um, now... I cannot remember how to play. I need to look up the instructions. Okay. Option, command, space. Slash. All right, let's see how we go. So the idea is uh, gravity. So they had originally called this game Gravity Well. And they have uh, different gravity for different planets. Hey, almost got hit. And they put an, an enormous amount of effort into making sure that collision detection was as accurate as possible. So they would draw... Th 
Oh shit. They would draw the ship uh, only after they had done all the all the collision detections. And they, their collision detection algorithm would, uh, yeah, would be based on shit. I'm dead. Uh, if there's something uh, black, if there's a black pixel underneath the ship. So if there's a bullet underneath the ship and it has to be a specific um, pixel, they had it down to the exact pixel, then your ship would get destroyed. And some of these walls are, are bouncy, some of them are not. You see gravity is pulling me in different directions. So on this planet, I'm being pulled to the left. And this is a, a, a fantastic game. I like it a lot, but it's also really difficult. And uh, most people uh, struggled to get through all the levels. You could also make your own levels. Uh, the process for doing that was uh, kind of uh, just like drawing some di drawing some really simple two D diagrams. This is something that I, I was very pleased to discover when I was working on the book. I, I'd never heard of it until I started researching. And I think actually the person who put me onto it was, of all people, John Romero, the one of the co-creators of, of Doom. So I, I'd emailed him to let him know if about my book because he actually did the Apple II GS ports of a couple of Mac games. So I thought he might be interested. And he said that he he hopes that, that I'm able to, to cover this game. Because he loved it. And so I went and looked it up and, and I thought it sounded fantastic. So I got in touch with Randy and, and his brother Brian and heard about all about how it was made and I looked on looked online and I found that it was quite popular on Usenet. Uh, one of the funnest stories I heard from, from Randy was that, damn, that they, they got contacted by a guy in Japan who wanted to send them a really expensive bottle of sake uh, and would not uh, despite Randy's request to, to just send money and tell them what to buy would not do that said the the one that he wanted to give them was only in avail only available in Japan and so he packed it incredibly well thankfully it didn't get snitched by by customs and he gave very specific instructions about how to drink it, what temperature to, to heat it up to. audio from this game, uh, they had no idea how to do sound. So they just kind of put random numbers into the sound buffer, hoping that they'd come up with something good. And through trial and error, they ended up with all these different sound effects. So I didn't get very far into it just then. But if you... If you jump forward a ways, 
things get tougher. I'm still getting my hand back on the keyboard. I mean, that's pretty cruel design, having having a cannon shooting right at where you appear in the level. I forget how many planets there are, um, but I remember it's a lot. There we go, 60. Let's go to the last one. So I'm being pulled down, and I've got to somehow go through the, some of those corridors. Let's loop around here. It, it, it. So you can see, if you manage to get inside, there's actually quite a lot of space on this level. But getting inside's not so easy. I thought maybe I could shoot down that corridor as I was passing, but nah. And so that Brian with the high score, I think that's Brian Wilson. Uh, this version I downloaded from uh, his website. Avoid the walls, kill things. <laughs> Don't always do things the obvious way is a pretty interesting tip. Let's see what the demo play is like. That was interesting. So people could create galaxies, and I happen to have one here that I downloaded from somewhere. So let's have a quick look at that. Gravity is pretty strong. And what is that? Oh, it's gone now. So this was originally developed in, in 1984. Uh, although, I think, what was it, 1987 it says they released it? Um, and that's pretty much entirely down to the publisher. Um, it was a road run game. Uh, they put out a Commodore 64 version, I think. I forget. They put it on a, an 8-bit computer, but they didn't do it with the same level of care. And so the Wilson brothers were very upset that when they played this, other version of their game, they'd see a bullet that clearly did not hit their ship, but it killed them because the collision detection was was doing it based on where the ship might be next, not where the ship is right now. Oh. That was not a bouncy wall. So that's that, and now um, 
I looked at that, didn't I? Yeah. Yeah. There was a, a patch released at one point uh, to make sure it could continue to work. This is what people had to go through in the early days of the Mac to play some games. They had to to really go through some crazy workarounds to, to get shareware games in particular to, to work properly. If you don't do exactly what you need to do on certain Macs, your Mac will crash and you could have damage to the data that you have on there. Much safer just to turn off the RAM cache. If you have easy access and you fire five times, you might accidentally turn on sticky keys. <laughs> Unless you'd like an extra challenge. And then it's Planet Editor. So this is how you, you made your levels. You had this editor. So again, we got something clearly inspired by Mac Taint. And so you can drag and drop things. You can type that. Here are different types of objects. Don't know what that is. So you got the different types of walls. B is a bouncing wall. Uh, P is not. So if you hit a bouncing wall, you'll just bounce right off it. If you hit a different kind of wall, you'll die. So that's the gravity thing. Set the width, the height, firing rate, planet bonus. Specify what direction the gravity is pushing you. You can have it set to wrap around. Uh, P is pass through. Okay. Yeah. And then that's the regular wall. So that uh, editor was, was very popular. Uh, there were a lot of uh, custom galaxies shared around. Uh, most of them, sadly, are, are long lost. Uh, unless people hap someone happens to have a, a whole cache of them hidden somewhere on a hard drive or a floppy disk. Um, but I could only find uh, that one Lee's galaxy. Uh, I think I, I saw references to a whole bunch of others. Okay, Mac Adventure game, sure. Let's look at Deja Vu. Welcome to a nightmare come true. And so context for this, um, King's Quest was released the year before on uh, on IBM PC Junior. Uh, and at the time, most adventure games were much like King's Quest, fantasy based. They were that they had magic in them, or they they had swords and and things like that. And he had something that was more like a a pulp fiction novel or a, a film noir. With a narrator that that had a very different tone to what everything else was doing. Uh, and this so this predates uh, the scum system. Uh, some of the guys who who worked at LucasArts were familiar with with this game. Uh, I don't recall to what extent Ron Gilbert uh, was aware of it, but this was one of the the early examples of having a, a point and click interface with all the verbs visible on the screen. Um, 
and as anyone who who played a, a LucasArts game might remember you you can get some some funny dialogue if you ask him to do weird things you can double click on things to to examine and you can drag and drop things to your inventory which is actually a nested inventory so i can I can open up my gun and look at my bullets. I can open up my jacket and there's another layer. And then there's yet another layer. And this is something that was uh, kind of unheard of, I think. And still now you, you don't really see this getting done. And maybe that is because it uh, is an unnecessary complication or maybe it it's just something that people have forgotten is is an interesting thing you could do yeah. <coughs> inventory management is is very frustrating sometimes but you can imagine that maybe uh, you could do interesting things with a nested inventory if you if you really thought about it and tried to come up with a interesting design. So I just ate my cigarettes. And yet the, the whole idea of, of being able to drill down through this stuff is directly inspired by, by the Macintosh. They, they just wanted to do a game version of it. It could also have been used by the Tin Man in The Wizards of Oz. There's the very dry wit of the narrator. And you have up here... Uh, when this finishes, <laughs> portraits of guys so uh, he was a, a genius teenage programmer uh, so was Darren Adler um, Kurt Nelson I think was the the writer Craig Erickson was uh, co-founder of of the company and he was the designer on on this um, it was kind of his idea to make the game Jay Zipnick was cousin of the other co-founder Todd Zipnick there is an Easter egg hidden in the game somewhere it's uh, apparently a single pixel uh, i've never found it and uh, craig didn't tell me when i interviewed him he just said that there is one somewhere and he's not sure if anyone's ever found it We can have a look around. <laughs> yes, you can also use verbs on yourself. Let's go wander a bit. So 
So the idea here is that you need to try and figure out kind of what happened, but then also uh, you're going to let's go up and I'll show you. You also have to clear your name. It's a typewriter. <laughs> it looks like a phone. <laughs> they love to crack jokes. So I can open up the desk, and what do we find here? A legal envelope. Well, that's an interesting <laughs> cocktail of drugs. Click to continue. Oh, and there's a clue there. Hang on to that. some pictures on the wall <laughs> looks like a poster of you oops didn't mean to do that I'm getting a bit turned around now if I happen to if I happen to get outside, I will kind of get myself dead. <laughs> no, no keys here. Um, There we go. What's that? Twenty dollar bill. Okay, those keys, they open the office, right? Yeah. time limit here. I'm going to die <laughs> if I don't take care of myself. Uh, trying to remember how to do this. Open door. There we go. And here we go. There's a dead body. So quite clearly, you have been framed. And so then you spend the, the rest of the game um, trying to piece together what happened and to make sure that you don't die. And you, you get all the evidence together and and you're able to, to clear your name in the end if you don't get yourself killed first. And that's Deja Vu. Very important early adventure game. Um, that and Shadowgate got put on the, the Nintendo Entertainment System, and uh, Shadowgate in particular did really well there. Uh, and unfortunately, after they made four Mac Ventures, that was it. They didn't pl they didn't make any more. They did work on some more, but they were all cancelled. Uh, let's pop into Glider. 
So people who have played more recent versions of Glider might be surprised to see that there were originally two different options. You could be a Glider or you could be a Dart. Controls, okay. Armor and Imperial. John Calhoun was very fond of putting his name in entirely lowercase. I'm not uh, aware of Glider 1 being around anymore. Uh, so I think this may be the, the earliest surviving version of Glider. And the source code is floating around as well on the internet. Now, John did get uh, quite a lot of letters from people. Um, the money he made from Glider was basically pizza and beer money. It was, it was just a little bit of pocket change. Uh, but he was a college student at the time, so it was great for him that he could go and every Friday night treat his girlfriend to pizza and a Coke. He believed um, very strongly in um, everyone helping each other out. So he tried uh, as much as he could to, to do that. Okay, and that is Dorothy, his, his logo. You took the... Oh, damn it. I got teleported back. He took the, the visual aesthetic for the game from his, his real life uh, conditions. So he was living in a, in a really crappy run-down dormitory and so he, he started making, making the game in the same style. With run-down walls and everything. And he made really good use of pattern dithering. So dithering is where you you, you use um, patterns of dots to, to give the illusion of different colors. And so he's used it on the floor here to, to give you a dark colored floor and on the wall he's got a much lighter color. He, he made pretty extensive use of it in his color games as well. Um, Glider 4. Uh, from the early 90s, uh, he, he he would take the, the 16 color palette of the Macintosh and he'd dither each of those colors with white to, to make more washed out, muted colors to to keep the, the illusion going of, of everything being run down and old. Oh, oh so close. Oops. Am I going to make it this time? No. Nope. So this version, I think uh, there were 10 rooms. And the, there was no cat yet. Why is the graphic not changed? That might be an error. Maybe you just didn't have the graphic for the, the Dart yet. So I'm controlling the Dart version, which moves much faster right now. As you can see, if I pop out of this and open up Glider 3, this was the last of the shareware versions. It's getting a bit more professional at this point. That fairy nymph is something he just he found in a book of engravings and he digitized it. So he, once again, you have that choice. The about screen is the same there. 
Now he's asking for eight dollars. Or fifteen if you want the source code as well. Controls are the same. Yep. So we can play fast or slow as well. And so as he's learning new programming techniques,